Good evening, and welcome to Children First, brought to us by Cable Access Television and Maryville Academy. I'm Sister Catherine Ryan, and I am delighted to introduce our guest this evening, who is Commissioner Evelyn Diaz. Uh, welcome, Commissioner. Thank you for having me, Sister Catherine. Uh, Commissioner Diaz, she's going to tell you about herself, but let me just introduce her by saying that she is the leader of the City of Chicago Department of Family and Support Services. Now that's a lot, and so I'm going to ask the Commissioner in a few minutes to tell us what her department does. But first I'd like to hear more about you, Commissioner. Can you tell us about your path to this position? Sure. Well, so maybe I should start with um, that I'm a native Chicagoan. All right. Uh, I was born in Chicago. My parents were born in Puerto Rico, and they came to um, Chicago and landed in Logan Square eventually, um, where my whole family is from. We, um, I went to Darwin Elementary School, and uh, then eventually we moved out to the suburbs and I graduated from Schomburg High School. Then I went to the University of Notre Dame, uh, where I majored in English, and um, sometime after that, uh, realized that I really wanted to just kind of get away, and so I, um, I went to have an immersion experience in a rural town in Costa Rica. Really? Yes, where I, where I taught um, English to um, elementary school students and some of the high school students. But it was a really transformative experience in that um, it, it made me realize that I didn't want to be a lawyer, which is what I thought I was going to be for my entire life. And so, um, so I had this amazing experience in this small community, uh, and and my path then begins from that point because my mother at the time was working at a health clinic, a free health clinic in Elgin, and so really small, would see about 20 patients a day. 70% of them were um, Spanish-speaking, undocumented immigrants um, in need of health care. So volunteer physicians, volunteer nurses. And the day I was going to be coming back from Costa Rica to the United States, she was going to be having this really big back surgery. And she asked me if I would take over the clinic and she would coach me over the phone wow. what to do. And so I didn't have another job. I decided to do that and uh, and just loved it. I loved helping these um, these families and these children. I knew they didn't have very many alternatives. We were providing a really important service for them. And I um, did that for about six months. My mom came back, took over her job, and then I started working for a big social service agency in Elgin. And that's when I knew that that was the path I was going to stay on. Um, ultimately went to graduate school at the University of Chicago uh, School of Social Service Administration and got my master's in, in, in administration there. Um, and then I, you know, I worked for Alderman Helen Schiller in the 46th Ward. Oh, the uptown. Some, yes. Uptown. I did some community organizing there, worked on some of her domestic violence and homeless issues. Um, and then I, I started working uh, for a, a, a nonprofit advocacy group around jobs for low-income people called the Chicago Jobs Council. And it was, I stayed there for a long time before finally um, I got a call one day um, asking, it was from the Mayor Daly's chief of staff. Uh, at the time, her, uh, it was Lori Healy. Mm -hmm. And I got a call saying the mayor's chief of staff would like to see you at 4 p.m. today. Uh, and so I went to that meeting and she said, you know, the mayor would like for you to be the deputy chief of staff for all of the human infrastructure departments. What an amazing opportunity for you to have an impact on how we do social services in the city. And, um, and kind of the rest is history. I said yes. Um, that started my path on, um, uh, in, uh, in, in government. I took a little hiatus. Um, Mayor Daly retired. Mayor Manuel comes in and um, I got recruited to come run the Department of Family and Support Services under the new administration. So you're working for your second mayor in Chicago. I am. <clears throat> and I'm sure you see some similarities and some differences, um, yes. but both dedicated to providing these kinds of services to families. Both very dedicated, inspirationally so. So now, Commissioner, you've brought us up to the time of your coming into the Department of Family and Support Services. When did you begin as the director, the commissioner? 
Um, well, I started with the Emanuel with admi mayor, all right. the administration. So on inauguration day, we went to the inauguration ceremony, and then all of the new commissioners went to their new roles all that right. same day. So you're a veteran now. Yes. <laughs> and 17, 18 months. Can you tell our, our uh, viewers, what is the department's mission? So we exist to, pr to improve the lives of um, Chicagoans, um, especially those who are most vulnerable from birth through the senior years. So our department, a lot of people aren't aware that our department has uh, in it a, a lot of what used to be former departments, children's services, youth services, domestic violence, homelessness, human services, senior services and workforce development are all now in this one department. So uh, we are, we manage about um, $350 million worth of mostly federal and state grants. Mm -hmm. And we put that out um, on the streets to provide services to Chicagoans, about 330,000 each year. Well, I think we wanna ask you more about these programs. If I may, since this is Domestic Violence Awareness Month, oh, how yeah. about starting with the programs you have to prevent or help victims of domestic violence? Great, thanks so much for teeing that up. It is Domestic Violence Awareness Month and it's a month where we wanna raise awareness of um, the help that's available through the city's help, Domestic Violence Helpline, which is one eight seven seven two end dv and, um, and so, one of the things that uh, we've been talking about during this month, in addition to raising awareness of the helpline, is uh, the fact that our domestic violence helpline fields about 30,000 calls each wow. year. And this year we have seen a slight uptick in the number of calls we're receiving on that. We're also aware that the Chicago Police Department has seen a small uptick in the number of domestic violence related calls um, and we also have seen us, us an uptick uh, in domestic violence homicides to date this year compared to this point in time last year. So in response to that, we're seeing this trend, we're responding to it pretty aggressively. The mayor in his recent budget address announced that our department in 2013 is going to be offering um, 3,000 additional domestic violence victims with um, services. Um, those are case management services and court advocacy services Good. to help women get orders of protection. We're also going to be expanding our supervised visitation and safe exchange programs. This is the place where custodial and non-custodial parents t take kids to do their uh, visitation without the um, domestic violence victim having to confront or be um, in the same place with her abuser. So it's a really important kind of uh, neutral safe haven that we created and we're going to ex um, expand that to be able to provide services to 100 more families this year. Um, so those are two big things happening in 2013 but also because we know that some of our domestic violence uh, community or delegate agencies or our community-based organizations that are providing services to domestic violence victims because we know that they haven't um, been able to maintain their crisis staff on a 24-hour basis mm -hmm. We've opened up our helpline, which is a 24-hour helpline, and we've said, instead of just doing information and referral, we're now gonna also provide crisis counseling around the clock. So we've expanded the service of our helpline to also be now uh, provide crisis service. So that's just a few of the things that we've been doing to respond to domestic violence. We're, we've applied for federal grants for domestic violence, uh, homicide prevention. Um, there are some other interesting things that we're doing to try to make it easier for our agencies to focus on their work and not on paper, administrative paperwork, things like that. Well, I'd, especially in these economic times when maybe some other agencies have to cut back on their services, it's, it's heartening to know that you're increasing the services. Can you give us that number again for it's, any of our viewers who might need that number? Absolutely. It's one eight seven seven to end DV. That's T O E N D D V. And, um, you know, if that seems like, you know, you didn't have a piece of paper or a pen, one of the, um, I, I, you can just call 311 and just say you want the domestic violence helpline and 311 can connect you. But once again, that number is 1 877 to end DV. Thank you for, uh, for giving that. Now that's 
a major part of the services of your department, but that's not even telling half the story, is it? No. You have so many other services. Um, let me just ask you before you name some of those. I know that you uh, are uh, leading a group of several agencies and that have been put together. Mm -hmm. And I know that you've been working hard to provide the services and develop efficiencies in these mm -hmm. difficult financial times. Mm -hmm. Would you like to talk a little bit about how you've accomplished that? Absolutely. So one of the things that we've been, um, I did an analysis um, recently to take a look at how much funding our department, or let's just call it social services for Chicago, has lost in federal and state grants over the past five years. And if you take out the economic stimulus, which really kind of rescued us from the impacts of this, mm -hmm. but it rescued us for three to four years. If you take that out, over the past five years, we've lost 10% of our funding on average every year for the past five years. That equates to about $180 million that we don't have today to spend on critical social services that we had five years ago. And, um, and what that means is, if that trend continues, it means that next year we're gonna have about $30 million less to work with oh. than we do this year. And, if, and it just keeps going on and on. So given that that's the reality that we're living into, we've really had to take a look um, in, in our department and ask ourselves if our first priority is to make sure that we keep services going, that we keep, it, we keep them at least level, we don't lose shelter beds, that we're able to continue serving as many meals to frail and homebound seniors, things like that. If, if that's our first priority, which it is, mm -hmm. what can we do, even though we're getting funding cuts, to make sure that we keep those services level? And what that means is we're gonna have to get really efficient about how we deliver services. And so um, a couple of examples. Uh, this year, one of, uh, one of the things that we did was we, we, uh, we, we figured out that one of the services we provide, we call it Human Services Mobile Outreach team in vans that transports homeless to shelters, that delivers food boxes to people who are homebound, um, that is our 24-hour transportation service during extreme heat and, um, and, and cold emergencies, that that service was costing us a lot of money. And that if we had Catholic Charities, for example, if we had a, a nonprofit perform the same service, we could save a lot of money and that by saving that money we could we could invest it in some of these programs that were being threatened by cuts mm -hmm. and so we pursued that and on, on october 1st we effected a transition from uh from our doing it to catholic charities performing the function we were able to save 1.7 million dollars in doing that wow. which we then plowed into homeless um homeless services pr uh, primarily um, we were able to, uh, we're going to be investing in a hundred new uh, shelter beds for youth and that's going to help us serve 1,400 homeless youth in the city. We're also opening three regional daytime centers for homeless youth. The other, um, and, uh, and the other area that was being threatened were home delivered meals to frail and homebound seniors. Mm -hmm. And so we were able to save what was going to be cut and essentially save 75,000 meals for seniors. So these are just um, just huge um, new investments that we're able to make just because we've decided to do the same exact service. We're just doing it in a different way and it's gonna save us a lot of money that we can use to save really vital programs. Oh, that's really heartening uh, to hear this kind of planning going on that you're doing in analysis and then mm -hmm. being able to preserve these services. Can you, I, I'm not sure if we should start from youngest to oldest or uh, most senior back, but maybe we should start with uh, this wonderful program you just described about seniors and meals for seniors. Mm -hmm. Can you say a bit about your helping homebound seniors? So our home delivered meals program is one of the biggest programs uh, that we have. In fact, senior services, it, it's interesting because if you actually put our, our services on the spectrum from the youngest to the oldest, um, our children's services is the largest um, area of the department and followed by senior services. Uh -huh. 
offer a number of different programs for seniors. One of the you know, most publicly recognizable is home delivered meals. We serve approximately 3.3 million meals wow. to homebound seniors every year. And um, uh, we've got about 9,000 seniors who are homebound or frail. The reason that this is so important, um, it obviously we're providing an, a, a basic need. We're providing food. We're providing nutritious food. Um, but it is also a way for us to engage with these seniors mm -hmm. who otherwise are not um, being seen very much by family or friends, in some cases don't have family or friends. So every day or every other day, they're getting a visit from our home delivered meals oh, delivery yeah. drivers. Um, it's a way for us to get information to those seniors when we're experiencing extreme cold, when we're ex experiencing extreme heat. This is one of the primary ways that we reach out to a population of seniors that we know really needs our help. Um, and so um, when we notice, um, when our drivers notice that maybe something's a little off uh, with this particular senior, they're usually really spunky and something's going on, they can notify us and we can send out a home visit uh, nurse to check up on that um, on, on that uh, senior. And so it's just a really, for many reasons, it's an important program for us. That sounds like it. And if we have a senior listening who'd like to be part of this program, how does that senior reach out to you? Um, I think the easiest thing to do is call 311, but for, for seniors, um, we also have an information and advocacy line, especially for them. That number is 312-744-4016. But again, if you just call 311 and say you're a senior and you're interested in home-delivered meals, um, they'll connect you to the right uh, person to talk to. Wow, that's a great program. And now I want to ask you about homeless youth. You mentioned all the beds that you have available for homeless youth. Can you say a little bit about how that program works? Well, it's a new program. So um, the, this year, um, we uh, in, in August, mm -hmm. Mayor Emanuel announced the plan, Homeless Plan 2.0. It's the new version of the plan to end homelessness. And um, it was the result of um, a year-long process with a huge group of stakeholders, advocates, providers, lots of homeless and formerly homeless individuals helped to help us think about what the city of Chicago needs to do to respond more effectively to the needs of homeless individuals. And one of the big recurring themes that came out and ended up being one of the principal recommendations in the plan was around addressing the growing need around uh, for homeless youth. Yes. So we know that the number is growing. Um, our, our prior counts of homeless didn't account for homeless youth in particular, so we don't have a good um, number to give you, but the number um, we suspect is pretty large. And we recognize that there just simply weren't enough beds in the homeless shelter system devoted to youth and their, their particular needs. And so um, it was recommended that the city, over the course of the plan, which is a seven-year plan, invest more in beds for homeless youth. And so the mayor took that challenge and said, okay, um, we're going to invest $2.5 million dollars to increase um, services to the homeless in a couple of areas. One is adding 100 beds to the city's youth shelter system. Um, that's actually uh, adding, adding 100 beds and three regional daytime support centers. So those beds that will be connected to support centers for, um, so that you'll have bed plus support. And it's gonna help us serve about 1,400 homeless youth across the city. Oh, that's wonderful. It is, and um, the other the other investment was in um, um, uh, workforce services for families who are in interim shelter. So we'll be able to provide workforce service to another 220 families to help them get jobs and be able to move out of interim shelters and into more permanent um, living arrangements. Well, that's terrific also. Yeah. There's a lot of projects here. Uh, I don't want to forget, though, to ask you about the little ones. Your early childhood program. Ah, yes. So early childhood, um, as I said earlier, uh, is one of the biggest programs that we have in the department. And it was made that much bigger recently. The mayor announced a $30 million investment in early childhood expansion. 
So, um, uh, so today we serve about 30,000 kids in early Head Start programs, which serve zero to three year olds, mm -hmm. Head Start programs, which are three to five year olds, child care programs, and, um, and summer nutrition. That, that's the, the sum total of our children's services. But the mayor's commitment was that we ex be able to expand slots, not just, not just continue to rely on whatever funding we were getting mm -hmm. from the federal government, but let's have a city commitment here as well, and made a really sizable um, contribution to our overall number of slots. So, um, so what's really exciting um, in, in our uh, early childhood division is, again, the mayor uh, has, has really committed that we um, do everything we can to raise the quality of the education being provided mm -hmm. to kids in this really important developmental time. So we, um, so he, he's pulled together um, a group of early learning experts, um, and together they've come up with a, um, a new kind of a new process for selecting Head Start agencies, early mm. Head Start agencies and pre-K agencies. An RFP went out this summer, request for proposals went out this summer, and um, we got tons of applications back. They're all being evaluated now, but the, but the point of that um, was really to say where there might have been differing quality across all of our programs, we're setting a new standard. We're going to set a higher bar, and we expect everyone who wants to be part of our network to show us, to demonstrate to us that they can meet that higher quality bar. And, and, and moreover, we're going to say, we're going to take a look at where the greatest need is in the city. And we're going to make sure that the services are located in those areas yes. of greatest need. And so this, this whole process where we're recompeting these grants and we are kind of, we're kind of hitting a reset button and, and increasing the quality of our programs. And then in addition to that, we have new money for new, uh, for an expansion of slots. It's just a really, it's a huge commitment on the part of the mayor. And, and frankly, I, um, our, our whole budget this year was, was gonna be bad news, if not for the mayor's commitment on early childhood, his investments in homelessness, in youth services, in domestic violence. His really came through for our department this year. Certainly, certainly did. And it's amazing in this time when we keep hearing about budget cuts and budget cuts, and we know that these are difficult financial times to uh, make these decisions of these priorities and take monies from other areas and move them in here so that they, they the children, homeless youth, and other right. groups, domestic violence, that we can actually provide more funding uh, until the day it's not ever needed, if that day is going to come to us. So. Um, Commissioner, it's been delightful having you here, and I realize that we only have about a minute left. Is there any final message you'd like to give to our viewers? Um, just, you know, um, it's a difficult time, and we, our department is doing everything that we can to meet the needs of the most vulnerable populations. We have many, many services, most of which most people aren't aware of. So I would say if you have a need, call 311 that your request is gonna to come to our department. We can have somebody call you and, um, and see what it is that we can do to be helpful to you and your family in your time of need. Thank you, Commissioner Evelyn Diaz, for Thank you sharing so with us the wonderful work that you and your department are doing. We are uh, grateful and please, you heard, call 311 if you need the services. And uh, thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for this evening. Thank you.